the topic is hypnosis is a natural state of mind. And you'll see why this is really true in, over the course of this next hour. I want you to know that all hypnosis is self-hypnosis. This isn't anything I do to you as a hypnotist. You do it to yourself, and as you'll see, you do it daily. It's basically your ability to convince or unconvince yourself of just about anything. It is a heightened state of focus. So let's talk about some of these myths. I cannot hypnotize you against your will. Dennis, I can't go up to you and go sleep, and you know, you'll do this unless you want to. It is a 100% consent state. I can't force you to do something that you don't want. I always tease my clients and say, I promise you on your way home, you won't start clucking like a chicken and barking like a dog, unless you want it, you know, because some people will say, can you do that? And I'm like, well, if you want me to, I will. It's not really what I do here, but if you want it, it can happen. When I was above the bank in my old office, I used to tell clients, if I would tell you to, you know, I'm a little short on cash, just stop by and, you know, hold them up on your way out and bring me some, you know, the average person would come right out of trance and say, what, what are you talking about? Now, if you were a natural born bank robber, you might think that's a pretty good idea and you'd be open to that suggestion. But the point is, is that you always have control. You cannot get stuck. That has only happened in the movies. If I were to drop dead of a heart attack next to my client and they didn't hear my voice for a few minutes and I hadn't told them I was gonna be quiet, they would just emerge wondering where I went. A lot of people think they can't be hypnotized. That is not true either. There's a small segment of the population that cannot. People who have very low IQs under 70, um, they don't have the imagination, they don't have the concentration, their brain doesn't function like a, a more normal brain. Uh, people with schizophrenia or some really serious mental disorders, same thing, their brains just don't function. And as you'll see in a little bit, that's really important for hypnosis. I don't have any special powers. I'm not psychic. I can't read your mind. I can't give you superpowers either. I can help you get better at whatever it is you want to accomplish, but you're never going to be that Superman. And I also don't know how many sessions it's going to take. A lot of times um, clients will ask and I'll say, well, it depends on your issue. I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just don't know until I talk more with them. So let me ask you, do you think this guy could be in hypnosis? How about this lady? Think she could be in trance? Or this girl? Or even this girl? How about him? Do you think he can be in hypnosis? Maybe? How about you when you're driving your car? Yes, yes that's right. <laughs> Absolutely right answer. Because you know you've driven from one place to the other and not remembered how you got there before, haven't you? We call that highway hypnosis. And because, as you'll see, we're using the weakest part of our brain, it gets tired and it likes to check out every once in a while when it gets overwhelmed. When we're doing something that's very familiar to us, our subconscious mind, which is our powerhouse, says, hey, look, take that mini vacation. I got your back. If anything happens, I'll let you know. And you can pop back in. But we really don't remember. But this is the way our conscious mind work, our consciousness, we call it. There's four stages. We right now are in what we call beta. This is our waking state. This is where we're functioning right now. When we get ready to go to bed at night, to go down here to delta to sleep, we have to go through two trance states. Alpha, that's where you are driving your car, not remembering. You are in alpha trance when you watch TV. TV is a great inducer of hypnosis. That's why people pay those big bucks for Super Bowl ads, because they know people are highly suggestible when they're watching television. Now, if I am watching an ad for, um, oh, a fine red wine, and I see that many, many times, I might decide to go out and buy that bottle of wine. If I'm watching an ad for Cialis, well, I'm not quite so interested in that. And that's probably never gonna have an effect on me. You're not going to be open to suggestions that you're not interested in or that go against your values. So twice a day, at least, you go in and out of trance. When you go from the waking state to sleep and when you wake up in the morning and go from sleep to waking. Consciousness 
is really a function of how fast your brain is cycling. Spring is coming, right? Our windows will start to be open and you know we're sound asleep and all of a sudden we're aware of the squirrels or the birds chirping. And it's just that foggy place. Our brain is just starting to wake up. We're headed into theta state. Theta is where I do my work. When my clients are with me, they are in deep trance in order to do the work. So it's really wonderful for you if as you wake up in the morning, when you're just becoming aware, or just before you drift off into sleep, you give yourself a good suggestion. I always ask my clients, what are you doing before you go to bed? And they'll say, well, I'm watching the news and then I go to bed. Stop it, because there's nothing good on the news. And you're already in trance watching that television, a light state of trance, all that stuff's going in there. And then you're gonna go deeper into trance just as you go to sleep and people who watch TV in their bed, never a good idea. Especially if they're watching things like Criminal Minds before they go to sleep. So what you say to yourself before you fall asleep and when you wake up is really, really important. If you're type A, I, this is my alarm clock. It is for a lot of people now. I used to make the mistake of turning off my alarm and I would look and I'd see that little irritating red button that said you, you, know, you have 43 emails and it's only six o'clock. That did not start my day out well. So let's talk about what happens in your brain. We know because of all the great imaging equipment we have, fMRIs and PET scans and the like, that trance is a chemical reaction that happens in your brain. There's a part of your brain up here, that little blank area called the corpus callosum. If you look down at the top of the brain, like through the top of your head, you'd have your right brain and your left brain. That's the division between the two. When you go into trance, your hippocampus secretes a lot of chemicals, and that whole area gets flooded with those chemicals. And it releases the energy between your left and your right brain, and they play nice together. Biochemically, in hypnosis, it's very similar to REM sleep. This is why people feel so good after they have a hypnosis session. In REM sleep is when our body heals, when our brain releases stress. So let's talk about how the mind is designed. The top triangle up there represents our conscious mind. It's only about 5% of our brain's capacity. It has the, less, the least amount of capacity. So on our best day, our um, conscious mind can process about seven to nine things at a time. That's it. After that, we get pretty overwhelmed. We start feeling the stress. We start forgetting things or losing track or not being very productive. If you look at that in contrast to our subconscious mind, 95%, our subconscious and unconscious mind can handle thousands of things at, uh, at a time. And we don't even know they're happening. So our conscious mind has a job, has several jobs, but primarily it's our logical part. It's responsible for being logical, analytical. We figure stuff out in our conscious mind. That's why we use it to get through our day-to-day -day life. Um, it also has to have a reason for everything. We have to figure stuff out for it to make sense, or we kind of go crazy when we can't figure things out. It's also the home to our short-term memory. So you know when you're asking a lot of your conscious mind, things start dropping off. You forget a lot when you're really busy, right? That's normal, and that part of your mind is not designed to keep things there long-term. It only keeps things there that we need for short term, like people's names, or phone numbers we call often, or you know how to put the key in the door, or how to brush our teeth. I'm gonna skip down here to the bottom part of the pyramid and talk about our unconscious and subconscious. Our unconscious regulates our bodily functions. However, hypnotically, we can actually control some of them, not most of them, but how fast we open and close our eyes, how fast we breathe. It also controls how fast we bleed. I had a client who had hammer toes and she had a surgery and they put rods in each one of her toes. And when they're healed after six weeks, they have to take them out. She didn't want it to hurt <laughs> and she didn't want to bleed. So I taught her self-hypnosis. She put herself in trance before she went to the doctor to get them out and told herself that, that she would not feel anything and that they wouldn't bleed and the doctor was astounded. So there are certain unconscious things that we can control in our body.
The subconscious though is where we do our work hypnotically. Now if we contrast, we know what the job of the conscious mind is, the, con the subconscious mind is almost the polar opposite. It cannot be analytical. It cannot logic or reason. It doesn't know how to do that. It is emotional. It is an imaginative. It's creative. It is the place where our beliefs reside, our, our rules reside, our life stories, all of our long-term memories, literally everything you have ever heard, seen, tasted, touched, everything you've experienced is in your subconscious mind and it does not go away. It's like a big computer, like a big database. It all goes in there and it stays there unless we go in and delete it. All that stuff is in there. It doesn't cause any problems. But then maybe one day it does. It's kind of like you get a new piece of software you go to install on your computer and there's stuff that's been in there a long time and all of a sudden things start going haywire because there's a conflict and you got to go in there and fix that software. That's what we do in hypnosis. Now there's a third part of our brain that's very important. It's called the critical factor. It's called a critical factor because it's our judgment piece. It decides what goes in and what doesn't go in. That starts to form when we're around seven or eight years old. And it's fully formed, usually sometime in our teen years, around 15, give or take. It's a protective piece. I'm 58 years old. I have a lot of stuff in my subconscious mind. If that critical factor wasn't there, all of that stuff could just bubble up as it wanted up into my very weak conscious mind and I would be crazy. If we, if we flip that over like a funnel, can you imagine if that critical factor wasn't there? Our conscious mind would be overwhelmed with information it cannot process. Now the negative to the critical factor is that when it is formed, we can no longer access what's in there with our conscious mind. So how many of you have memories from probably below five? A couple of people, yeah. But are they really your memories or are they stories you've heard a million times or pictures that you've seen? Because that influences, right? What we find is that very few people have actual memories, things they could not have known in any other way. And I'll give you an example, someone who's been adopted. There's no pictures, there's no original parents. People can access, I had a guy come to me for that reason. He wanted to know what his birth mother looked like and all the records were sealed. And he was able to access that. Was it real or not? I don't know. It sure seemed real, I have to tell you. And it didn't matter because my philosophy is if it helps you with whatever you've come in for, who cares if it's real? It's like getting the sugar pill placebo, right? The, the deal is, is that it's all in there and that critical factor in hypnosis, when we have that energy dissipating between the two halves of the brain, when you're in trance, we can bypass that critical factor and see what's in there. So if you come in with a habit you wanna change or something is going on in your life and you just can't figure it out, chances are there's something in there from a long time ago that is causing some problems. We call it emotional resonance. So I had a woman come in here not too long ago and um, she just started crying for no reason. Three or four times a day, she just burst into tears and she couldn't figure out what was going on. She thought she was going crazy or having a breakdown of some sort. And through hypnosis, we found that there was Something that had changed in her life, I can't speak as to what it is, but something had changed in her life that every time she saw it, it triggered an old emotion that was connected to that. So in hypnosis, we can bypass that critical factor, get to what's in there, and you can simply say to yourself, do I need this anymore? Is it serving me anymore? And if not, you can choose to let it go. And that's how powerful it is. Um, so, there's an old Harry Chapin song um, called Corey's Coming, and the song is about reality. And in it, he says, reality is just a word. It's simply a word. And I want to prove that to you now. So, I'd like all of you, if you would, to stand up. 
And right in front of you, with that little um, nut on a string, I'd like you to pick that up, and there's a piece of paper with a circle on it and some lines through it. So hold your nut over that piece of paper a couple inches off of it. And I, this is the instructions now. I don't want you to move your hand. I want you to keep your hand still. Put it in your dominant hand. And using your eyes and your thoughts only, watch the paper. Using your eyes and your thoughts only, allow that pendulum to swing from A to B. Just concentrate on it. And using your eyes and your thoughts, allow it to swing A to B, left to right. And you can try it from C to D as well. I find some people can imagine and focus more one direction than the other. Yeah, and that's what's happening here. Good job. There you go. And once you get it going, once you figure this out, have a little fun with it and have it trace the circle. Have it trace the circle in your mind. Imagine it going round and round that circle. One of these days I'm going to do a compilation video of people's reactions to this because they're like, I've had people throw the thing down and go, oh my God, what's going on? There you go. Look at that. Some are bigger, some are littler, some are subtle. It's however you imagine it. All right. All right. Put, you can go ahead and sit down. Now I want to talk to you about what happened here. This is not woo-woo. This isn't me sending some psychic vibes out to you. What happens, and we know this through neuroscience experiments, when you have a thought, a certain part of your brain goes into action. And it thinks that you're actually moving it. It can't, your brain cannot tell the difference between what you vividly imagine or you feel emotionally and what's real. And so when it thinks that you're moving it, because I said, with your eyes and your thoughts, and it sends a signal to your fingers, and in those two fingers where you're holding that string, there's very minute muscles, and they actually move. It, we cannot perceive it consciously, but they move, and that's what moves that pendulum. So the lesson here is that imagination is very powerful. Imagination is in extremely critical. I'll give you a couple of examples. There are two doctors, a neuroscientist, that did an experiment with two groups of people. The first group of people, they had them come in and exercise their finger like this every single day for 10 minutes a day for 30 days. They had the other group of people just close their eyes and imagine moving their finger like that, but they never moved it. And in the background, somebody was yelling, harder, harder. So they did that for 10 minutes a day for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, the scientists bring them back in and they measure their finger strength. The people that actually did the exercise had increased strength of 30% in their fingers. Makes sense, right? The people who didn't move it, who just imagined it, had increased strength of 23%. One of the early experiments was with poison ivy. They brought in a group of people, divided them in half, they were all allergic to poison ivy, and they told them, look, okay, we're gonna, or they didn't divide this group, they just brought them all in. We're gonna hypnotize you, and when you're in, in hypnosis, we're gonna take poison ivy, we're gonna rub it on your right arm, and we're gonna rub your left arm with some oak leaves. And so they get them all into trance, they said, okay, here goes the poison ivy, here goes the oak leaves, and immediately all but two people in the group broke out in hives. They lied, they put it on the left arm, and it was the right arm that reacted. It was their expectation, it was their imagination of what was gonna happen and that influenced their body. Imagination is really important, and that's why we use imagination and emotion so vividly in hypnosis. The point of all this is that thoughts become things. Your thoughts become things. When you say, I am or I can't, whatever comes after that is who you are and what you can do. I have clients say to me all the time, well, I can't do that. And I say, yeah, you're right, you can't. And they look at me like, well, you're supposed to disagree. No, if you've been telling yourself I can't for five years, you can't. As soon as you say the words, you can't. 
It's your thought, and it defines you. So we have to choose our thoughts wisely. We have to become more aware of what we say, not only to other people, we have to start with ourselves. And when we think things often enough, or we do things often enough, they become habits. All habits are, are automated thoughts, feelings, or actions. That's all they are. It has to work that way in our brain because in our brain, it's estimated that we have 100 billion nerve cells. Each one of them connects to like 5,000. They interconnect, they work together in tandem. So when we do something, your brain takes notice because it has to be efficient. That's a lot of stuff to keep track of all at once. Our brains are so powerful. So for example, when was the last time you thought about tying your shoes? Probably when you learned to do it, right? Because you've touched those shoelaces and your shoes are tied. You don't think about how to do it, cross them over, put them under, make that little bow. If you try to think about it, it's gonna take you about five times longer to tie your shoe. Every time you pick up your toothbrush or your tube of toothpaste, your brain says, oh, I know what to do. You don't think about the process anymore. You just do it because you've done it so much. That's how your brain automates things. It does it with, with actual physical actions and with thoughts. Here's the good news. We change our thoughts every day. I got up this morning with the intention of wearing a blue shirt. I put all my clothes out the night before because I like to get up at the last minute. And I looked at that blue shirt and I said, why did I pick that out of my closet? I don't want to wear that. I want to wear the black one and the shiny jacket. And I changed my thought. So we do that all the time. Habits can be changed. When we first do something new, our brain registers, oh, that's new, that's new. And if we do it a couple of times, it says, oh, she's done this a couple of times now. I need all these connections to do that activity. And it wants to be efficient. So energetically, it kind of puts them on layaway, puts them on hold. And if I do it again, maybe for a week or two, my brain says, oh, she's not giving this one up. Then it chemically bonds all of the nerves, the neurons that it takes to do that activity. Now it's stronger connection, which means it's gonna happen a little faster for you. And you're gonna have to think about it a lot less. You think it's almost becoming a habit, but not quite. It takes about five to six weeks for it to become a habit. Because what happens when it is actually a habit is our brain says, oh, she's never given this up. We are physically bonding it. And those nerves all wire together. They grow together. So that's why, I'll give you an example. I, I had really, really bad knees for a long time. And there came a point where I couldn't do a lot of exercise. I couldn't ride my bike anymore. So for about three years, I couldn't ride my bike. And then I had to have both my knees replaced. Um, I did it at the same time. I did not take any pain meds. I just used hypnosis. I didn't have any pain. And this last year, I finally decided I'm gonna get back on my bike. Now, it's been about five years since I rode a bike. And they say, you never forget. When I got on that bike, I was a little shaky because I hadn't done it in a while, right? I had to take that habit and dust it off in my brain. But by the time I got to the end of the street, it was like I'd never not done it. Sometimes habits can get put away for a long time. But we can change habits. And what we know, we don't know why, but what we have seen is even that physical bonding can be broken like this in hypnosis. It doesn't happen that often, but it does happen. Every thought can be changed. And, thought, and habits are nothing more than automated thoughts. So how do we do this in hypnosis? Well, the name of my um, center is the FAIR Hypnosis Center, and FAIR is an acronym for the four laws of the mind. As focus, associate, repeat, and expect. What we focus on expands. I remember I bought a car when I was in my 30s. I was so excited about this car, it's a really beautiful car, and I loved it because I never saw them anywhere. So I go and I buy the car, I'm driving home from the dealership, and on my way home, I see 10 of them. It was like, really? It was anywhere, but that, where's my focus? It's on my car, right? So all of a sudden, I start noticing them. They were always there. I just didn't pay attention to them before. 
So in hypnosis, we focus on the solution, not the problem. I want the solutions to be what you're focused on. That's what we want to expand. When your thoughts and the images in your mind are very similar to your focus, everything gets connected to that. So I might have a smoker that, come, that comes in, and, and, and this is almost, it's amazing how many people say this almost word for word that smoke. I just love getting up in the morning, having that first cigarette and a cup of coffee, reading the newspaper with my breakfast. That's what they'll say. So what are they associated? Getting up, having breakfast, cup of coffee, newspaper, and that cigarette. All of those things are gonna trigger that behavior of smoking. So in hypnosis, we eliminate those triggers or we change them. We substitute something else that reinforce unwanted behaviors. So we can, you can still get up and have breakfast and read the paper and have a cup of coffee. We just need to eliminate and replace the need for that cigarette. When we repeat these things often enough and invest some passion into it, it becomes who you are. It becomes your truth. So that smoker that says, I just love, well, what stronger emotion is there than love? That's a pretty passionate word to attach to a cigarette. It becomes their truth. So what we do is we make sure that your beliefs are in alignment with your goals. That is usually a huge problem with some people. There's an old belief in there that is not in line with what they now want to accomplish. Maybe at the time that belief was formed, it served them very well. But right now, it's getting in their way of making that change. So it's as simple as eliminating that belief. And then finally, the E is for expect. Because you get exactly what you expect you will. That critical factor, it filters out anything to the contrary. Now, I have lost 40 pounds using hypnosis. And I could stand in front of the mirror with my willpower and my affirmations, which reside in my conscious mind. And I could say to myself, wow, Roberta, look how loose those pants are now. They used to fit you tight. You are looking good. You got energy. Your face is so much smaller. And by the way, you look hot in that mini skirt. Now, my conscious mind is going to call down through that critical factor to my subconscious mind and say, hey, she thinks she looks hot in that miniskirt. Do we let that one in? And my subconscious mind is gonna say, uh, no, no. Yeah, she looks better, but that is not the belief we have here. She is still fat, she's got a long way to go before she wears that miniskirt and looks hot. Because that's my belief. Now I can stand in front of my mirror and tell myself that every single day, every single hour, and that is never gonna take root because it is totally contrary to a belief that I have. So I either need to lose more weight or I need to change that belief and talk myself into thinking that I look amazing in that miniskirt. Got it? So we make sure that your expectations are in line with your goals. I mentioned my knee replacement. I use a certain breathing technique with the expectation that every time I breathed in that some certain way, I would have total comfort in my knees. And so after my surgery, if I ever felt a little tingling or anything, I would just, and there would be total comfort there. Now I practiced that every day, five times a day for six weeks before my surgery, but it never failed me. I, you don't have to experience pain as pain. Pain is experienced based on what you're told and what your expectations are or your previous experiences. Your brain can process pain if it wants to. It doesn't have to if it doesn't want to. It chooses what you feel. If I'm running across the road and I fall and I break my ankle, that's gonna hurt. It's gonna send something to your brain that says, hey, you broke your ankle here. But if I look up and there's a bus speeding at me, I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna fly across that street. And it's not till I get to the other side of the street that my brain is gonna register that my ankle hurts because where's the danger? The bus, that's what it's gonna choose. So our brain can say, I'm gonna feel it now or I'm not. And we can influence that. So what do we work on in hypnosis? We work on all kinds of things. You've heard me mention a lot of things today. Sleep issues, pain management, 
weight loss, weight gain for some people, smoking cessation, fear, stress, relaxation, um, confidence building, people biting nails, people grinding their teeth. People come to me for, can you make me love my mother-in-law? That's a real situation, I swear. Um, any questions on what we've heard? Yes, Dennis. Did they give you anything for pain uh, during your surgery? Or I, I had anesthesia during my surgery. Afterwards, I had my surgery late, <clears throat> and during the night, they gave me pain meds because I was out of it and sleeping. <laughs> Um, but in the morning when they came in with the pills, I said, I don't need them. It was all self-hypnosis. I made a tape with how I wanted everything to go. I listened to it every single day for six weeks. And I envisioned myself the first time I got out of bed, literally just swinging my legs over, standing up, and walking to the bathroom. Now, I'm sure it did not look as graceful as what I thought it was in my head. But when I did that, the nurses were astounded. Okay, so that wraps it up for today. I hope you all had an amazing time today and learned a lot about hypnosis. And I look forward to seeing you at some of our workshops in the future.